Venters heads off to discover the cattle rustler's hideout in Deception Pass. But when he crosses paths with the masked rider, everything goes sideways. Zane Gray, today on the Classic Tales Podcast. Welcome to the Classic Tales Podcast. Thank you for listening. We are proudly supported by our listeners. We couldn't do this without you. Your monthly donation helps in so many ways, and it also gives you access to more classic titles. Go to classictalesaudiobooks.com and become a financial supporter today. Thank you so much. The Arsène Lupin podcast is out. Three episodes are now available on the feed, and a new episode will be released every Wednesday. Right now, this is a limited series, but if it takes off, we may add to it. So tell your friends about our favorite Gentleman Burglar's own show. A link to subscribe can be found in the notes for today's episode. This week, we continue our series of Riders of the Purple Sage by Zane Gray. Last week, we met Jane Witherstein, a wealthy, single woman who owns an extensive ranch in southern Utah. Her refusal to enter into a polygamous marriage with Tull caused a deal of friction and threats from the Mormon elders. Venters, her most trusted hand, saw Judkins riding afar, riding like gangbusters back to the ranch, apparently with some terrible news. And now, Riders of the Purple Sage, Part 2 of 12, by Zane Gray. Chapter 4, Deception Pass The rider thundered up and almost threw his foam-flecked horse in the sudden stop. He was a giant form, and with fearless eyes. Judkins, you're all bloody, cried Jane in a fright. Oh, You've been shot. Nothing much, Miss Witherstein. I got a nick in the shoulder. I'm some wet, and the horse has been throwing lather, so all this ain't blood. What's up? queried Venters, sharply. Rustlers sloped off with the red herd. Where are my riders? demanded Jane. Miss Witherstein, I was alone all night with the herd. At daylight this morning, the rustlers rode down. They began to shoot at me on sight. They chased me hard and far, burning powder all the time, but I got away. Judd, they meant to kill you, declared Venters. Now I wonder, returned Judkins. They wanted me bad, and it ain't regular for rustlers to waste time chasing one rider. Thank heaven you got away, said Jane. But my riders, where are they? I don't know. The night riders weren't there last night when I rode down. And this morning I met no day riders. Chodkins, burn! They've been set upon, killed by Oldring's men. I don't think so, replied Venters decidedly. Jane, your riders haven't gone out in the sage. Burn, what do you mean? Jane Witherstein turned deadly pale. You remember what I said about the unseen hand? Oh, impossible! I hope so. But I fear. Venters finished with a shake of his head. Burn your bitter, but that's only natural. We'll wait to see what's happened to my riders. Judkins, come to the house with me. Your wound must be attended to. Jane, I'll find out where Oldring drives the herd, vowed Venters. No, no! Burn, don't risk it now. When the rustlers are in such shooting mood, I'm going. Judd, how many cattle in that red herd? Twenty-five hundred head. Phew! What on earth can Oldring do with so many cattle? Why, a hundred head is a big steal. I've got to find out. Don't go, implored Jane. Burn, you want a horse that can run. Miss Witherstein, if it's not too bold of me to advise, make him take a fast horse or don't let him go. Yes, yes, Judkins. He must ride a horse that can't be caught. Which one, Black Star? Knight? Jane, I won't take either said Venters emphatically. I won't risk losing one of your favorites. Wrangle, then. That's the horse, 
replied Judkins. Wrangell can outrun Blackstar and Knight. You'd never believe it, Miss Witherstein, but I know. Wrangell's the biggest and fastest horse on the sage. Oh, no, Wrangell can't beat Blackstar. But, Burn, take Wrangell if you will go. Ask Jurd for anything you need. Oh, be watchful, careful. Godspeed you. She clasped his hand, turned quickly away, and went down a lane with the rider. Venters rode to the barn, and leaping off, shouted for Jurd. The boy came running. Venters sent him for meat, bread, and dried fruits, to be packed in saddlebags. His own horse he turned loose into the nearest corral. Then he went for Wrangle. The giant sorrel had earned his name for a trait the opposite of amiability. He came readily out of the barn, but once in the yard, he broke from Venters and plunged about with ears laid back. Venters had to rope him, and then he kicked down a section of fence, stood on his hind legs, crashed down and fought the rope. Jurd returned to lend a hand. Wrangle don't get enough work, said Jurd, as the big saddle went on. He's unruly when he's corralled and wants to run. Wait till he smells the sage. Jurd, this horse is an iron-jawed devil. I never straddled him but once. Run? Say, he's swift as wind. When Venters' boot touched the stirrup, the sorrel bolted, giving him the rider's flying mount. The swing of this fiery horse recalled to Venters days that were not really long past, when he rode into the sage as the leader of Jane Witherstein's riders. Wrangle pulled hard on a tight rein. He galloped out of the lane, down the shady border of the grove, and hauled up at the watering trough, where he pranced and champed his bit. Venters got off and filled his canteen while the horse drank. The dogs, Ring and Whitey, came trotting up for their drink. Then Venters remounted and turned Wrangle toward the sage. A wide, white trail wound away down the slope. One keen, sweeping glance told Venters that there was neither man nor horse nor steer within the limit of his vision, unless they were lying down in the sage. Ring loped in the lead, and Whitey loped in the rear. Wrangle settled gradually into an easy swinging canter, and Venter's thoughts, now that the rush and flurry of the start were past, and the long miles stretched before him, reverted to a calm reckoning of late singular coincidences. There was the night ride of Tull's, which, viewed in the light of subsequent events, had a look of his covert machinations. Oldring and his masked rider and his rustlers riding muffled horses. The report that Tull had ridden out that morning with his man Jerry on the trail to Glaze. The strange disappearance of Jane Witherstein's riders. The unusually determined attempt to kill the one Gentile still in her employ. An intention frustrated, no doubt, only by Judkin's magnificent riding of her racer. And lastly, the driving of the red herd. These events, to Venter's color of mind, had a dark relationship. Remembering Jane's accusation of bitterness, he tried hard to put aside his rancor in judging Tull. But it was bitter knowledge that made him see the truth. He had felt the shadow of an unseen hand. He had watched till he saw its dim outline. And then he had traced it to a man's hate, to the rivalry of a Mormon elder, to the power of a bishop, to the long, far-reaching arm of a terrible creed. That unseen hand had made its first move against Jane Witherstein. Her riders had been called in, leaving her without help to drive 7,000 head of cattle. But to Venters, it seemed extraordinary that the power which had called in these riders had left so many cattle to be driven by rustlers and harried by wolves. For hand in glove with the power was an insatiate greed. They were one and the same. What can Oldring do with twenty-five hundred head of cattle? muttered Venters. Is he a Mormon? Did he meet Tull last night? It looks like a black plot to me. But Tull and his churchmen wouldn't ruin Jane Witherstein unless the church was to profit by that ruin. Where does Oldring come in? I'm going to find out about these things. Wrangle did the twenty-five miles in three hours, and walked little of the way. When he had gotten warmed up, he had been allowed to choose his own gait. 
The afternoon had well advanced when Venters struck the trail of the red herd and found where it had grazed the night before. Then Venters rested the horse and used his eyes. Near at hand were a cow and a calf and several yearlings, and farther out in the sage some straggling steers. He caught a glimpse of coyotes skulking near the cattle. The slow sweeping gaze of the rider failed to find other living things within the field of sight. The sage about him was breast high to his horse, over sweet with its warm, fragrant breath, gray where it waved to the light, darker where the wind left it still, and beyond the wonderful haze purple lent by distance. Far across that wide waste began the slow lift of uplands through which Deception Pass cut its tortuous, many-canyoned way. Venters raised the bridle of his horse and followed the broad cattle trail. The crushed sage resembled the path of a monster snake. In a few miles of travel, he passed several cows and calves that had escaped the drive. Then he stood on the last high bench of the slope, with the floor of the valley beneath. The opening of the canyon showed in a break of the sage, and the cattle trail paralleled it as far as he could see. That trail led to an undiscovered point where Oldring drove cattle into the pass, and many a rider who had followed it had never returned. Venters satisfied himself that the rustlers had not deviated from their usual course. Then he turned at right angles off the cattle trail and made for the head of the pass. The sun lost its heat and wore down to the western horizon, where it changed from white to gold and rested like a huge ball about to roll on its golden shadows down the slope. Venters watched the lengthening of the rays and bars and marveled at his own league-long shadow. The sun sank. There was instant shading of brightness about him, and he saw a kind of cold purple bloom creep ahead of him to cross the canyon to mount the opposite slope and chase and darken and bury the last golden flare of sunlight. Venters rode into a trail that he always took to get down into the canyon. He dismounted and found no tracks, but his own made days previous. Nevertheless, he sent the dog Ring ahead and waited. In a little while, Ring returned, whereupon Venters led his horse on to the break in the ground. The opening into Deception Pass was one of the remarkable natural phenomena in a country remarkable for vast slopes of sage, uplands insulated by gigantic red walls and deep canyons of mysterious source and outlet. Here the valley floor was level, and here opened a narrow chasm, a ragged vent in yellow walls of stone. The trail down the five hundred feet of sheer depth always tested Venter's nerve. It was bad going for even a burrow. But Wrangle, as Venters led him, snorted defiance or disgust rather than fear, and, like a hobbled horse on the jump, lifted his ponderous iron-shod forehoofs and crashed down over the first rough step. Venters warmed to great admiration of the sorrel, and giving him a loose bridle, he stepped down foot by foot, Oftentimes the stones and shale started by Wrangle buried Venters to his knees. Again he was hard put to it to dodge a rolling boulder. There were times when he could not see Wrangle for dust, and once he and the horse rode a sliding shelf of yellow, weathered cliff. It was a trail on which there could be no stops, and therefore if perilous, it was at least one that did not take long in the descent. Venters breathed lighter when that was over and felt a sudden assurance in the success of his enterprise. For at first it had been a reckless determination to achieve something at any cost, and now it resolved itself into an adventure worthy of all his reason and cunning, and keenness of eye and ear. Pinion pines clustered in little clumps along the level floor of the pass. Twilight had gathered under the walls. Venters rode into the trail and up the canyon, Gradually the trees and caves and objects low down turned black, and this blackness moved up the walls till night enfolded the pass, while day still lingered above. The sky darkened, the stars began to show, 
at first pale and then bright. Sharp notches of the rim wall, biting like teeth into the blue, were landmarks by which Venters knew where his camping site lay. He had to feel his way through a thicket of slender oaks to a spring, where he watered Rangel and drank himself. Here he unsaddled and turned Rangel loose, having no fear that the horse would leave the thick, cool grass adjacent to the spring. Next he satisfied his own hunger, fed Ring and Whitey, and with them curled beside him, composed himself to await sleep. There had been a time when night in the high altitude of these Utah uplands had been very satisfying to Venters. But that was before the oppression of his enemies had made the change in his mind. As a rider guarding the herd, he had never thought of the night's wildness and loneliness. As an outcast, now when the full silence set in, and the deep darkness, and trains of radiant stars shone cold and calm, he lay with an ache in his heart. For a year he had lived as a black fox, driven from his kind. He longed for the sound of a voice, the touch of a hand. In the daytime there was riding from place to place, and the gun practice to which something drove him, and other tasks that at least necessitated action. At night, before he won sleep, there was strife in his soul. He yearned to leave the endless sage slopes, the wilderness of canyons, and it was in the lonely night that this yearning grew unbearable. It was then that he reached forth to feel Ring or Whitey, immeasurably grateful for the love and companionship of two dogs. On this night, the same old loneliness beset Venters. The old habit of sad thought and burning unquiet had its way. But from it evolved a conviction that his useless life had undergone a subtle change. He had sensed it first when Wrangle swung him up to the high saddle, he knew it now when he lay in the gateway of Deception Pass. He had no thrill of adventure, rather a gloomy perception of great hazard, perhaps death. He meant to find Old Ring's retreat. The rustlers had fast horses, but none that could catch Wrangle. Venters knew no rustler could creep upon him at night when Ring and Whitey guarded his hiding place. For the rest, he had eyes and ears, and a long rifle and an unerring aim, which he meant to use. Strangely, his foreshadowing of change did not hold a thought of the killing of Tull. It related only to what was to happen to him in Deception Pass, and he could no more lift the veil of that mystery than tell where the trails led to in that unexplored canyon. Moreover, he did not care, and at length, tired out by stress of thought, he fell asleep. When his eyes unclosed, day had come again, and he saw the rim of the opposite wall tipped with the gold of sunrise. A few moments sufficed for the morning's simple camp duties. Near at hand he found Wrangle, and to his surprise the horse came to him. Wrangle was one of the horses that left his viciousness in the home corral. What he wanted was to be free of mules and burrows and steers, to roll in dust patches, and then to run down the wide, open, windy sage plains, and at night browse and sleep in the cool, wet grass of a spring hole. Jerd knew the sorrel when he said of him, Wait till he smells the sage. Venters saddled and led him out of the oak thicket, and leaping astride, rode up the canyon, with Ring and Whitey trotting behind. An old grass-grown trail followed the course of a shallow wash, where flowed a thin stream of water. The canyon was a hundred rods wide. Its yellow walls were perpendicular. It had abundant sage and a scant growth of oak and pinion. For five miles, it held to a comparatively straight bearing, and then began a heightening of rugged walls and a deepening of the floor. Beyond this point of sudden change in the character of the canyon, Venters had never explored, and here was the real door to the intricacies of Deception Pass. He reined Wrangle to a walk, halted now and then to listen, and then proceeded cautiously with shifting and alert gaze. The
the canyon assumed proportions that dwarfed those of its first ten miles. Venters rode on and on, not losing in the interest of his wide surroundings any of his caution or keen search for tracks or sight of a living thing. If there ever had been a trail here, he could not find it. He rode through sage and clumps of pinion trees and grassy plots where long-petaled purple lilies bloomed. He rode through a dark constriction of the pass, no wider than the lane in the grove at Cottonwoods. And he came out into a great amphitheater, into which jutted huge, towering corners of a confluence of intersecting canyons. Venters sat his horse, and with a rider's eye, studied this wild crosscut of huge stone gullies. Then he went on, guided by the course of running water. If it had not been for the main stream of water flowing north, he would never have been able to tell which of those many openings was a continuation of the pass. In crossing this amphitheater, he went by the mouths of five canyons, fording little streams that flowed into the larger one. Gaining the outlet, which he took to be the pass, he rode on again under overhanging walls. One side was dark in shade, the other light in sun. This narrow passageway turned and twisted and opened into a valley that amazed Venters. Here again was a sweep of purple sage, richer than upon the higher levels. The valley was miles long, several wide, and enclosed by unscalable walls. But it was the background of this valley that so forcibly struck him. Across the sage flat rose a strange upflinging of yellow rocks, he could not tell which were close and which were distant. Scrawled mounds of stone, like mountain waves, seemed to roll up steep, bare slopes and towers. In this plain of sage, venters flushed birds and rabbits, and when he had proceeded about a mile, he caught sight of the bobbing white tails of a herd of running antelope. He rode along the edge of the stream, which wound toward the western end of the slowly looming mounds of stone the high slope retreated out of sight behind the nearer protection. To Venters, the valley appeared to have been filled in by a mountain of melted stone that had hardened in strange shapes of rounded outline. He followed the stream till he lost it in a deep cut. Therefore Venters quit the dark slit which baffled further search in that direction and rode out along the curved edge of stone where it met the sage. It was not long before he came to a low place, and here Wrangle readily climbed up. All about him was ridgy roll of wind-smoothed, rain-washed rock. Not a tuft of grass or a bunch of sage colored the dull, rust yellow. He saw where, to the right, this uneven flow of stone ended in a blunt wall. Leftward, from the hollow that lay at his feet, mounted a gradual, slow-swelling slope to a great height, topped by leaning, cracked, and ruined crags. Not for some time did he grasp the wonder of that acclivity. It was no less than a mountainside, glistening in the sun like polished granite, with cedar trees springing as if by magic out of the denuded surface. Winds had swept it clear of weathered shale. The rains had washed it free of dust. Far up the curved slope, its beautiful lines broke to meet the vertical rim wall, to lose its grace in a different order and color of rock, a stained yellow cliff of cracks and caves and seamed crags. And straight before Venters was a scene less striking but more significant to his keen survey. For beyond a mile of bare, hummocky rock began the Valley of Sage and the mouths of canyons, one of which surely was another gateway into the pass. He got off his horse, and giving the bridle to Ring to hold, he commenced a search for the cleft where the stream ran. He was not successful, and concluded that the water dropped into an underground passage. Then he returned to where he had left Wrangle, and led him down off the stone to the sage. It was a short ride to the opening canyons. There was no reason for a choice of which one to enter. The one he rode into was a clear, sharp shaft in yellow stone a thousand feet deep, 
with wonderful wind-worn caves low down, and high above, buttressed and turreted ramparts. Farther on, Venters came into a region where deep indentations marked the line of canyon walls. These were huge, cove-like blind pockets, extending back to a sharp corner with a dense growth of underbrush and trees. Venters penetrated into one of these offshoots, and, as he had hoped, he found abundant grass. He had to bend the oak saplings to get his horse through. Deciding to make this a hiding place if he could find water, he worked back to the limit of the shelving walls. In a little cluster of silver spruces, he found a spring. This enclosed nook seemed an ideal place to leave his horse and to camp at night, and from which to make stealthy trips on foot. The thick grass hid his trail. The dense growth of oaks in the opening would serve as a barrier to keep Wrangle in, if, indeed, the luxuriant brows would not suffice for that. So Venters, leaving Whitey with the horse, called Ring to his side, and, rifle in hand, worked his way out to the open. A careful photographing in mind of the formation of the bold outlines of rim rock assured him he would be able to return to his retreat, even in the dark. Bunches of scattered sage covered the center of the canyon, and among these Venters threaded his way with the step of an Indian. At intervals he put his hand on the dog and stopped to listen. There was a drowsy hum of insects, but no other sound disturbed the warm midday stillness. Venter saw ahead a turn, more abrupt than any yet. Warily, he rounded this corner, once again to halt, bewildered. The canyon opened fan-shaped into a great oval of green and gray growths. It was the hub of an oblong wheel, and from it, at regular distances, like spokes, ran the outgoing canyons. Here a dull red color predominated over the fading yellow. The corners of wall bluntly rose, scarred and scrawled, to taper into towers and serrated peaks and pinnacled domes. Venters pushed on more heedfully than ever. Toward the center of this circle, the sagebrush grew smaller and farther apart. He was about to sheer off to the right, where thickets and jumbles of fallen rock would afford him cover, when he ran right upon a broad cattle trail. Like a road it was, more than a trail, and the cattle tracks were fresh. What surprised him more, they were wet. He pondered over this feature. It had not rained. The only solution to this puzzle was that the cattle had been driven through water, and water deep enough to wet their legs. Suddenly Ring growled low. Venters rose cautiously and looked over the sage. A band of straggling horsemen were riding across the oval. He sank down, startled and trembling. Rustlers, he muttered. Hurriedly, he glanced about for a place to hide. Near at hand there was nothing but sagebrush. He dared not risk crossing the open patches to reach the rocks. Again, he peeped over the sage. The rustlers, four, five, seven, eight in all, were approaching, but not directly in line with him. There was relief for a cold deadness which seemed to be creeping inward along his veins. He crouched down with bated breath and held the bristling dog. He heard the click of iron-shod hoofs on stone, the coarse laughter of men, and then voices gradually dying away. Long moments passed. Then he rose. The rustlers were riding into a canyon. Their horses were tired, and they had several pack animals. Evidently they had traveled far. Venters doubted that they were the rustlers who had driven the red herd. Holding's band had split. Venters watched these horsemen disappear under a bold canyon wall. The rustlers had come from the northwest side of the oval. Venters kept a steady gaze in that direction, hoping if there were more, to see from what canyon they rode. A quarter of an hour went by. Reward for his vigilance came when he descried three more mounted men, far over to the north. But out of what canyon they had ridden it was too late to tell. He watched the three ride across the oval and round the jutting red corner 
where the others had gone. Up that canyon, exclaimed Venters. Old Ring's den. I found it. A knotty point for Venters was the fact that the cattle tracks all pointed west. The broad trail came from the direction of the canyon into which the rustlers had ridden, and undoubtedly the cattle had been driven out of it across the oval. There were no tracks pointing the other way. It had been in his mind that Oldring had driven the red herd toward the rendezvous, and not from it. Where did that broad trail come down into the pass, and where did it lead? Venters knew he wasted time in pondering the question, but it held a fascination not easily dispelled. For many years, Oldring's mysterious entrance and exit to Deception Pass had been all-absorbing topics to sage riders. All at once the dog put an end to Venter's pondering. Ring sniffed the air, turned slowly in his tracks with a whine, and then growled. Venter's wheeled. Two horsemen were within a hundred yards, coming straight at him. One, lagging behind the other, was Old Ring's masked rider. Venter's cunningly sank, slowly trying to merge into sagebrush. But guarded as his action was, the first horse detected it. He stopped short, snorted, and shot up his ears. The rustler bent forward, as if keenly peering ahead. Then, with a swift sweep, he jerked a gun from its sheath and fired. The bullet zipped through the sagebrush, flying bits of wood struck Venters, and the hot, stinging pain seemed to lift him in one leap. Like a flash, the blue barrel of his rifle gleamed level, and he shot once, twice. The foremost rustler dropped his weapon and toppled from his saddle to fall with his foot catching in a stirrup. The horse snorted wildly and plunged away, dragging the rustler through the sage. The masked rider huddled over his pommel, slowly swaying to one side, and then, with a faint, strange cry, slipped out of the saddle. Chapter 5 The Masked Rider Venters looked quickly from the fallen rustlers to the canyon, where the others had disappeared. He calculated on the time needed for running horses to return to the open, if their riders heard shots. He waited breathlessly, but the estimated time dragged by, and no riders appeared. Venters began presently to believe that the rifle reports had not penetrated into the recesses of the canyon, and felt safe for the immediate present. He hurried to the spot where the first rustler had been dragged by his horse. The man lay in deep grass, dead, jaw fallen, eyes protruding, a sight that sickened Venters. The first man at whom he had ever aimed a weapon he had shot through the heart. With the clammy sweat oozing from every pore, Venters dragged the rustler in among some boulders and covered him with slabs of rock. Then he smoothed out the crushed trail in grass and sage. The rustler's horse had stopped a quarter of a mile off and was grazing. When Venters rapidly strode toward the masked rider, not even the cold nausea that gripped him could wholly banish curiosity. For he had shot Oldring's infamous lieutenant, whose face had never been seen. Venters experienced a grim pride in the feat. What would Tull say to this achievement of the outcast, who rode too often to Deception Pass? Venter's curious eagerness and expectation had not prepared him for the shock he received when he stood over a slight, dark figure. The wrestler wore the black mask that had given him his name, but he had no weapons. Venter's glanced at the drooping horse. There were no gun sheaths on the saddle. A rustler who didn't pack guns, muttered Venter's. He wears no belt. He couldn't pack guns in that rig. Strange. A low gasping intake of breath and a sudden twitching of body told Venters the rider still lived. He's alive. I've got to stand here and watch him die. And I shot an unarmed man. Shrinkingly, Venters removed the rider's wide sombrero and the black cloth mask. This action disclosed bright chestnut hair, inclined to curl, and a white, youthful face. Along the lower line of cheek and jaw was a clear demarcation, where the brown of tanned skin met the white that had been hidden from the sun. Oh, 
He's only a boy. What? Can he be Oldring's masked rider? The boy showed signs of returning consciousness. He stirred. His lips moved. A small brown hand clenched in his blouse. Venters knelt with a gathering horror of his deed. His bullet had entered the rider's right breast, high up to the shoulder. With hands that shook, Venters untied the black scarf and ripped open the blood-wet blouse. First he saw a gaping hole, dark red against a whiteness of skin, from which welled a slender red stream. Then the graceful, beautiful swell of a woman's breast. A woman, he cried. A girl. I've killed a girl. She suddenly opened eyes that transfixed Venters. They were fathomless blue. Consciousness of death was there, a blended terror and pain, but no consciousness of sight. She did not see Venters. She stared into the unknown. Then came a spasm of vitality. She writhed in a torture of reviving strength, and in her convulsions she almost tore from Venters' grasp. Slowly she relaxed and sank partly back. The ungloved hand sought the wound and pressed so hard that her wrist half buried itself in her bosom. Blood trickled between her spread fingers, and she looked at Venters with eyes that saw him. He cursed himself at the unerring aim of which he had been so proud. He had seen that look in the eyes of a crippled antelope which he was about to finish with his knife. But in her, it had infinitely more, a revelation of mortal spirit, the instinctive bringing to life was there, and the divining helplessness, and the terrible accusation of the stricken. Forgive me. I didn't know, burst out Venters. You shot me. You've killed me, she whispered in panting gasps. Upon her lips appeared a fluttering, bloody froth. By that Venters knew the air in her lungs was mixing with blood. Oh! I knew it would come some day. Oh, the burn! Hold me. I'm sinking. It's all dark. Oh, God! Mercy! Her rigidity loosened in one long quiver, and she lay back limp, still, white as snow, with closed eyes. Venters thought then that she died but the faint pulsation of her breast assured him that life yet lingered. Death seemed only a matter of moments, for the bullet had gone clear through her. Nevertheless, he tore sage leaves from a bush, and pressing them tightly over her wounds, he bound the black scarf round her shoulder, tying it securely under her arm. Then he closed the blouse, hiding from his sight that blood-stained, accusing breast. What? Now, he questioned with flying mind. I must get out of here. She's dying, but I can't leave her. He rapidly surveyed the sage to the north and made out no animate object. Then he picked up the girl's sombrero and the mask. This time, the mask gave him as great a shock as when he first removed it from her face. For in the woman, he had forgotten the rustler and this black strip of felt cloth established the identity of Oldring's masked rider. Venters had solved the mystery. He slipped his rifle under her, and lifting her carefully upon it, he began to retrace his steps. The dog trailed in his shadow, and the horse that had stood drooping by followed without a call. Venters chose the deepest tufts of grass and clumps of sage on his return. From time to time he glanced over his shoulder. He did not rest. His concern was to avoid jarring the girl and to hide his trail. Gaining the narrow canyon, he turned and held close to the wall till he reached his hiding place. When he entered the dense thicket of oaks, he was hard put to it to force a way through. But he held his burden almost upright, and by slipping sidewise and bending the saplings, he got in. Through sage and grass, he hurried to the grove of silver spruces. He laid the girl down, almost fearing to look at her. 
Though marble pale and cold, she was living. Venters then appreciated the tax that long carry had been to his strength. He sat down to rest. Whitey sniffed at the pale girl and whined and crept to Venters' feet. Ring lapped the water in the runway of the spring. Presently, Venters went out to the opening, caught the horse, and leading him through the thicket, unsaddled him and tied him with a long halter. Wrangell left his browsing long enough to whinny and toss his head. Venters felt that he could not rest easily till he had secured the other rustler's horse. So, taking his rifle and calling for Ring, he set out. Swiftly yet watchfully, he made his way through the canyon to the oval and out to the cattle trail. What few tracks might have betrayed him, he obliterated, so only an expert tracker could have trailed him. Then, with many a wary backward glance across the sage, he started to round up the rustler's horse. This was unexpectedly easy. He led the horse to lower ground, out of sight from the opposite side of the oval along the shadowy western wall, and so on into his canyon and secluded camp. The girl's eyes were open. A feverish spot burned in her cheeks. She moaned something unintelligible to Venters, but he took the movement of her lips to mean that she wanted water. Lifting her head, he tipped the canteen to her lips. After that she again lapsed into unconsciousness, or a weakness which was its counterpart. Venters noted, however, that the burning flush had faded into the former pallor. The sun set behind the high canyon rim, and a cool shade darkened the walls. Venters fed the dogs and put a halter on the dead rustler's horse. He allowed Wrangle to browse free. This done, he cut spruce boughs and made a lean-to for the girl. Then, gently lifting her upon a blanket, he folded the sides over her. The other blanket he wrapped about his shoulders and found a comfortable seat against a spruce tree that upheld the little shack. Ring and Whitey lay near at hand, one asleep, the other watchful. Venters dreaded the night's vigil. At night, his mind was active, and this time he had to watch and think and feel beside a dying girl whom he had all but murdered. A thousand excuses he invented for himself, yet not one made any difference in his act or his self-reproach. It seemed to him that when night fell black, he could see her white face so much more plainly. She'll go presently, he said, and be out of agony, thank God. Every little while, certainty of her death came to him with a shock, and then he would bend over and lay his ear on her breast. Her heart still beat. The early night blackness cleared to the cold starlight. The horses were not moving, and no sound disturbed the deadly silence of the canyon. I'll bury her here, thought Venters, and let her grave be as much a mystery as her life was. For the girl's few words, the look of her eyes, the prayer, had strangely touched Venters. She was only a girl, he soliloquized. What was she to old ring? Rustlers don't have wives, nor sisters, nor daughters. She was bad, that's all. But somehow, well, she may not have willingly become the companion of rustlers. That prayer of hers to God for mercy. Life is strange and cruel. I wonder if other members of Old Ring's gang are women. Likely enough. But what was his game? Old Ring's masked rider. A name to make villagers hide and lock their doors. A name credited with a dozen murders, a hundred forays, and a thousand stealings of cattle. What part did the girl have in this? It may have served Old Ring to create a mystery. Hours passed. The white stars moved across the narrow strip of dark blue sky above. The silence awoke to the low hum of insects. Venters watched the immovable white face, and as he watched, hour by hour, waiting for death, the infamy of her passed from his mind. He thought only of the sadness, the truth of the moment. Whoever she was, whatever she had done, she was young and she was dying. 
The after part of the night wore on interminably. The starlight failed, and the gloom blackened to the darkest hour. She'll die at the gray of dawn, muttered Venters, remembering some old woman's fancy. The blackness paled to gray, and the gray lightened, and day peeped over the eastern rim. Venters listened at the breast of the girl. She still lived. Did he only imagine that her heart beat stronger, ever so slightly, but stronger? He pressed his ear closer to her breast, and he rose with his own pulse quickening. If she doesn't die soon, she's got a chance, the barest chance to live, he said. He wondered if the internal bleeding had ceased. There was no more film of blood upon her lips, but no corpse could have been whiter. Opening her blouse, he untied the scarf and carefully picked away the sage leaves from the wound in her shoulder. It had closed. Lifting her lightly, he ascertained that the same was true of the hole where the bullet had come out. He reflected on the fact that clean wounds closed quickly in the healing upland air. He recalled instances of riders who had been cut and shot, apparently to fatal issues. Yet the blood had clotted, the wounds closed, and they had recovered. He had no way to tell if internal hemorrhage still went on, but he believed that it had stopped. Otherwise, she would surely not have lived so long. He marked the entrance of the bullet and concluded that it had just touched the upper lobe of her lung. Perhaps the wound in the lung had also closed. As he began to wash the bloodstains from her breast and carefully rebandage the wound, he was vaguely conscious of a strange, grave happiness in the thought that she might live. Broad daylight and a hint of sunshine high on the cliff rim to the west brought him to consideration of what he had better do. And while busy with his few camp tasks, he revolved the thing in his mind. It would not be wise for him to remain long in his present hiding place. And if he intended to follow the cattle trail and try to find the rustlers, he had better make a move at once. For he knew that rustlers, being riders, would not make much of a day's or night's absence from camp for one or two of their number. But when the missing ones failed to show up in reasonable time, there would be a search. And Venters was afraid of that. A good tracker could trail me, he muttered, and I'd be cornered here. Let's see. Rustlers are a lazy set when they're not on the ride. I'll risk it then I'll change my hiding place. He carefully cleaned and reloaded his guns. When he rose to go, he bent a long glance down upon the unconscious girl. Then ordering Whitey and Ring to keep guard, he left the camp. The safest cover lay close under the wall of the canyon, and here through the dense thickets, Venters made his slow, listening advance toward the oval. Upon gaining the wide opening, he decided to cross it and follow the left wall till he came to the cattle trail. He scanned the oval as keenly as if hunting for antelope. Then stooping, he stole from one cover to another, taking advantage of rocks and bunches of sage, until he had reached the thickets under the opposite wall. Once there, he exercised extreme caution in his surveys of the ground ahead but increased his speed when moving. Dodging from bush to bush, he passed the mouths of two canyons, and in the entrance of a third canyon, he crossed a wash of swift clear water to come abruptly upon the cattle trail. It followed the low bank of the wash, and keeping it in sight, Venters hugged the line of sage and thicket. Like the curves of a serpent, the canyon wound for a mile or more, and then opened into a valley. Patches of red showed clear against the purple of sage, and farther out on the level, dotted strings of red led away to the wall of rock. Ha! Huh, the red herd! exclaimed Venters. Then dots of white and black told him there were cattle of other colors in this enclosed valley. Oldring, the rustler, was also a rancher. Venters' calculating eye took count of stock that outnumbered the red herd. What a range, went on Venters. 
water and grass enough for 50,000 head, and no riders needed. After his first burst of surprise and rapid calculation, Venters lost no time there, but slunk again into the sage on his back trail. With the discovery of Oldring's hidden cattle range had come enlightenment on several problems. Here the rustler kept his stock. Here was Jane Witherstein's red herd. Here were the few cattle that had disappeared from the cottonwood slopes during the last two years. Until Oldring had driven the red herd, his thefts of cattle for that time had not been more than enough to supply meat for his men. Of late, no drives had been reported from Stirling or the villages north. And Venters knew that the riders had wondered at Oldring's inactivity in that particular field. He and his band had been active enough in their visits to Glaze and Cottonwoods. They always had gold. But of late, the amount gambled away and drunk and thrown away in the villages had given rise to much conjecture. Oldring's more frequent visits had resulted in new saloons, and where there had formerly been one raid or shooting fray in the little hamlets, there were now many. Perhaps Oldring had another range farther up on the pass, and from there drove the cattle to distant Utah towns, where he was little known. But Venters came finally to doubt this, and from what he had learned in the last few days, a belief began to form in Venters' mind that Oldring's intimidations of the villages and the mystery of the masked rider, with his alleged evil deeds and the fierce resistance offered any trailing riders, and the rustling of cattle, these things were only the craft of the rustler chief to conceal his real life and purpose and work in Deception Pass. And like a scouting Indian, Venters crawled through the sage of the Oval Valley, crossed trail after trail on the north side, and at last entered the canyon out of which headed the cattle trail, and into which he had watched the rustlers disappear. If he had used caution before, now he strained every nerve to force himself to creeping stealth and a sensitiveness of ear. He crawled along so hidden that he could not use his eyes except to aid himself in the toilsome progress through the breaks and ruins of cliff wall. Yet from time to time as he rested, he saw the massive red walls growing higher and wilder, more looming and broken. He made note of the fact that he was turning and climbing. The sage and thickets of oak and breaks of alder gave place to pinion pine growing out of rocky soil. Suddenly a low, dull murmur assailed his ears. At first he thought it was thunder, then the slipping of a weathered slope of rock, but it was incessant, and as he progressed it filled out deeper and from a murmur changed into a soft roar. Falling water, he said. There's volume to that. I wonder if it's the stream I lost. The roar bothered him, for he could hear nothing else. Likewise, however, no rustlers could hear him. Emboldened by this, and sure that nothing but a bird could see him, he arose from his hands and knees to hurry on. An opening in the pinions warned him that he was nearing the height of slope. He gained it, and dropped low with a burst of astonishment. Before him stretched a short canyon with rounded stone floor bare of grass or sage or tree, and with curved, shelving walls. A broad, rippling stream flowed toward him, and at the back of the canyon, waterfall burst from a wide rent in the cliff, and bounding down in two green steps, spread into a long, white sheet. If Venters had not been indubitably certain that he had entered the right canyon, his astonishment would not have been so great. There had been no breaks in the walls, no side canyons entering this one where the rustler's tracks and the cattle trail had guided him, and therefore he could not be wrong. But here the canyon ended, and presumably the trails also. That cattle trail headed out of here, Venters kept saying to himself. It headed out. Now what I want to know is how on earth did cattle ever get in here? If he could be sure of anything, it was of the careful scrutiny he had given that cattle track, every hoof mark of which headed straight west. He was now looking east in an immense round boxed corner of canyon down which tumbled a thin white veil of water 
scarcely twenty yards wide. Somehow, somewhere, his calculations had gone wrong. For the first time in years, he found himself doubting his rider's skill in finding tracks and his memory of what he had actually seen. In his anxiety to keep under cover, he must have lost himself in this offshoot of Deception Pass and thereby, in some unaccountable manner, missed the canyon with the trails. There was nothing else for him to think. Rustlers could not fly, nor cattle jump down thousand-foot precipices. He was only proving what the sage riders had long said of this labyrinthine system of deceitful canyons and valleys. Trails led down into Deception Pass, but no rider had ever followed them. On a sudden, he heard above the soft roar of the waterfall an unusual sound that he could not define. He dropped flat behind a stone and listened. From the direction he had come swelled something that resembled a strange muffled pounding and splashing and ringing. Despite his nerve, the chill sweat began to dampen his forehead. What might not be possible in this stone-walled maze of mystery? The unnatural sound passed beyond him as he lay gripping his rifle and fighting for coolness. Then from the open came the sound, now distinct and different. Venters recognized a hobble bell of a horse and the cracking of iron on submerged stones and the hollow splash of hoofs in water. Relief surged over him. His mind caught again at realities, and curiosity prompted him to peep from behind the rock. In the middle of the stream waited a long string of packed burrows, driven by three superbly mounted men. Adventures met these dark-clothed, dark-visaged, heavily armed men anywhere in Utah, let alone in this robber's retreat. He would have recognized them as rustlers. The discerning eye of a rider saw the signs of a long, arduous trip. These men were packing in supplies from one of the northern villages. They were tired, and their horses were almost played out, and the burrows plodded on, after the manner of their kind when exhausted, faithful and patient, but as if every weary, splashing, slipping step would be their last. All this Venters noted in one glance. After that, he watched with a thrilling eagerness. Straight at the waterfall the rustlers drove the burrows, and straight through the middle, where the water spread into a fleecy, thin film like dissolving smoke. Following closely, the rustlers rode into this white mist, showing a bold black relief for an instant, and then they vanished. Venters drew a full breath that rushed out in brief and sudden utterance. Good heaven! Of all the holes for a rustler, there's a cavern under that waterfall, and a passageway leading out to a canyon beyond. Oldring hides in there. He needs only to guard a trail leading down from the sage flat above. Little danger of this outlet to the pass being discovered. I stumbled on it by luck after I had given up, and now I know the truth of what puzzled me most, why that cattle trail was wet. He wheeled and ran down the slope and out to the level of the sagebrush. Returning, he had no time to spare, only now and then, between dashes, a moment when he stopped to cast sharp eyes ahead. The abundant grass left no trace of his trail. Short work he made of the distance to the circle of canyons. He doubted that he would ever see it again. He knew he never wanted to. Yet he looked at the red corners and towers with the eyes of a rider picturing landmarks never to be forgotten. Here, he spent a panting moment in a slow-circling gaze of the sage oval and the gaps between the bluffs. Nothing stirred except the gentle wave of the tips of the brush. Then he pressed on past the mouths of several canyons and over ground new to him, now close under the eastern wall. This latter part proved to be easy traveling, well screened from possible observation from the north and west, and he soon covered it and felt safer in the deepening shade of his own canyon. Then the huge, notched bulge of red rim loomed over him, a mark by which he knew again the deep cove where his camp lay hidden. As he penetrated the thicket, safe again for the present, 
his thoughts reverted to the girl he had left there. The afternoon had far advanced. How would he find her? He ran into camp, frightening the dogs. The girl lay with wide open, dark eyes, and they dilated when he knelt beside her. The flush of fever shone in her cheeks. He lifted her and held water to her dry lips and felt an inexplicable sense of lightness as he saw her swallow in a slow, choking gulp. Gently, he laid her back. Who are you? She whispered haltingly. I'm the man who shot you, he replied. You'll not kill me now? No, no. What will you do with me? When you get better, strong enough, I'll take you back to the canyon where the rustlers ride through the waterfall. As with a faint shadow from a flitting wing overhead, the marble whiteness of her face seemed to change. Don't take me back there. This is B.J. Harrison. I hope you've enjoyed this unabridged production of Riders of the Purple Sage, Part 2 of 12, by Zane Gray. If you have enjoyed this book, please become a monthly supporter by going to classictalesaudiobooks.com. Donate $5 a month and get a monthly coupon code for $8 off any audiobook order. It's a great way to build your library of classic literature. Thanks for pitching in. Thank you for joining me today and allowing classic literature to awaken your better self. Please join me every week and we'll rediscover the greatest stories ever put to paper. <laughs>